Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Good evening. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on and bless him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory. Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. <clears throat> God bless you, sister. Sister Kim, for joining. God bless you. Praise the Lord. We're going to get started in a minute. Hallelujah. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to start out um, opening with the scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 1 and 2. It's there, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining Webster. God bless you, Lashonda. God bless you. It's wonderful to come together again one more time to study God's word. I pray something be said tonight that will help you think and examine your minds to see where you are in your faith in God. What thoughts are you allowing to dominate you? Are you having the mind of Christ? Or are you being governed by your own reasonings, your own intellect? Or are you allowing yourself to be surrendered daily to the Lord's leadership and its governing authority? Or are you allowing yourself to be controlled, manipulated, deceived by the enemy? There's something to think about because every day we're in a battle. Every day is a warfare that's going on. And it's up to us to recognize what battle are we engaging in and how do we arm ourselves against the enemy. And one thing about this scripture, Romans 12, 1, it says, it tells us that we must present. That means offer ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Every day is a process of dying to yourself and allowing Christ to be revealed to live through you. It is very vital to your Christian growth, to your spiritual health, for you to be balanced. It's very important to learn how to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit that Christ's life will be revealed through you. Then it goes on and says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. That means don't be squeezed into the world system. Don't allow the world to govern you by its own ways of doing things, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
Every day is a transformation. That's metamorphosis. There has to be a transform, a change mindset every day that we can prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God for our lives. So let us open up in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you for another opportunity to share your word tonight. I pray that something be said that will be done to inspire, to edify, to encourage, to strengthen the weak, to empower us, to have total dependency upon you, that you're able to carry us through every trials, test, temptation that comes our way, that we're standing firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, God, first of all, for our sins and iniquities that we have allowed ourselves to engage in. And then, Lord God, not only forgive us, but cleanse us. Purge with hyssop, and we shall be clean. Wash us, we shall be white as snow. Take the blood of the Lamb, Father God, and begin to purify our thoughts and our actions tonight, Father God, by your presence dwelling in our midst today, O oh God. And we thank you that we yield surrender and release ourselves to you, Father God, that you would have your God-like way in us. And then, Lord God, allow the Holy Spirit to refresh us, to revive us, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to help us to be motivated every day to strive toward perfection, to become more and more like you in our daily walk, our daily activities, and our daily lifestyles. And I thank you in Jesus' name for healing God through the word of God, that your word will heal and deliver those who are afflicted mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, God. Doesn't matter what that illness is, God, that you heal and set them free right now by the power of the word of God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight, Victor and Benzi. God bless you. Tonight, we're going to continue to start where we had to pick up where we started in last week, the battlefield of the mind. We are in a spiritual warfare. Many of you, if you don't know it, I'm going to let you know tonight. We're in a spiritual warfare. Every day is a spiritual war taking place in our minds that's against God. In Galatians, I love the word of God because the word of God, it really opens up our understanding, gives us clarity and gives us insight uh, how and what we're engaging in every day in our, in our lives. Now, get a Romans, Romans chapter, uh, uh, let's see, 8. I think it's 8. Let me go to Romans 8. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Then it goes on to say that, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That word enmity is a word that's hostile. It's a opposing force against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Verse 8, for then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is not of his. So it's clarity being revealed here through the word of God that we are of the spirit of God. We're born of the spirit of God and therefore God's spirit dwells in us. And it says, you don't have the spirit of God living inside of you, then you're none of God. You have no relationship with him. It says for in verse 10 it said, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So if your body is said it's dead, there's talking about that fleshly nature. It's dead, but the spirit of life is because of righteousness. So the life that we're living is a life of Christ that permeates that controls, that governs our lifestyles daily because we're learning through the word of God that it's his righteousness. The, the price he paid on the cross for our redemption and his, his resurrection brought us righteousness. And what that means is that when we were transgressors against the law of God, we were, we were fighting against God, we were hostile in our minds, God 
through the power of the Holy Spirit, brought us that new life that, that gave us the access to be brought into right standing and right relationship with the Father through his Son. That's a good news. That's awesome news. But then it goes on in verse 11, says, But if the Spirit in him raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. So the Spirit of God that lives inside of you, it says the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead, also it's the same power that quickened, made alive your mortal bodies. That's your new nature by the spirit that dwells in you. Then verse 12 says, Therefore, brother, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. So we, he said, we're not debtors. So in other words, we're not to, don't have to pay the price for our sin nature anymore. Because we're not flesh anymore. We're spirit, spiritual beings now connected right standing in right relationship with God. Then it says, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But but if you if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, hallelujah, they are the sons of God. That is so awesome. That is so awesome to know that we are, are, are born into a new relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So therefore, the reason why we're dealing with the battlefield of the mind is because many people in the body of Christ don't know how to arm themselves against the enemy. So that's one thing about the battlefield of the mind. The book written by Joyce Myers is a very informative book and a very, a very great book to add to your library because it has a lot of enriching tools in that book to teach you and show you yourself and how we're governed by the flesh if we don't allow the Spirit of God to take control of our thought life. Does that make sense? Amen. 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 So, so 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's another key, key scripture we're going to go to tonight. It comes uh, as one of the scriptures for the book, The Battle for the Mind, one of the key verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And it says, Chapter 10, but for mine, jumped up. Chapter 4, the thing goofy. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we'll start at verse 3. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The next verse, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in readiness to, uh, to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So what this is saying is that we're fleshly beings, but yet we're spiritual beings. And because we're spiritual beings, we are not governed to fight a, a spiritual war with the fleshly tools or weapons. It's very important to recognize that the only way you're going to defeat the enemy that comes against you is to stay connected to Jesus Christ who has won the victory and has conquered all of our foes. And if we don't stay connected in right relationship and right standing with the Lord Jesus Christ, then we open up, I talked about a few weeks ago about a breach. We open up a breach into our lives which grants the enemy access to come in and out of your life to do just what he chooses to do to destroy you. So it's very important that you recognize that this spiritual battle that we're engaged in is not a carnal battle. It's a spiritual battle that's only can be, be fought or defeated with spiritual weapons. So it's very important to know you cannot fight spirit with flesh. You only fight the flesh with the spirit. But then it says casting down imaginations. That means your reasonings, your thought life. The things you allow to govern your thought the most, 
that's not of God, inherit every high thought that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. So if your thought contradicts who God is in your life, then he's saying that you're, spirit, you're in a spiritual warfare. And this is Paul talking to the church at Corinthian. And he's letting them know that if your thought life is not controlled by the Spirit of God, then your thought life, it opposes the knowledge of God. But he said we must bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then he says, and having in readiness to, uh, to revenge or avenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, for those of you who are taking notes, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6. Amen? So, let's go to our book tonight. Last week we talked about how important it is to recognize that the actions of our thoughts are directed by ourselves. And if we have a negative mind, we have negative life. So if we don't realize what we're allowed to open up into our lives by the enemy, then we're putting ourselves in, in, a, in a, a vulnerable place to be attacked by the enemy. So just like Proverbs 23, verse 7, Proverbs 23, chapter, verse 7, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So whatever thought that you're allowed to govern your life is what's going to control your destiny. And you have the power to change it by your thought life. Just like I remember uh, uh, Vince, Norman Vincent Peel, he, say, he says that a person thought, it says, what a man thinks he is, he said, but he said, but what you think is what you become, pretty much what it's about. It's not what a man thinks he is, but what a man thinks he is. So if you think yourself into a negativity all the time and you, you have a messed up morning so you wake up with a negative attitude and and the whole day is just ruined because of one negative thought that took control of your life the devil is a liar the lord says we have the power of death and life in our tongue so we have to realize what am i confessing when i wake up in the morning so it says for the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. That's the amplified version. And as much as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets us up, up against the true knowledge of God, and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, the Amplified Version. Amen. That means it, it magnifies, it brings it more to clarity and understanding. We, even a child can understand what it's talking about. So tonight we're going to go into chapter 1. We started last week, chapter 1. It says, from this scripture, we see that we are in a war. A careful study in, of this verse informs us that our warfare is not with human beings, but with the devil and his demons. Our enemy, Satan, attempts to defeat us with strategies and deceit through well-laid plans and deliberate deceptions. So you got to recognize when the enemy comes in a subtle way, it doesn't matter who he comes through, we're not fighting people. That's why I said earlier, we're not fighting flesh with spiritual battle. In a spiritual battle, we're not fighting against flesh with spirit with uh, fleshly weapons. We're fighting against the flesh with the spiritual weapon, which is the word of God. The only way to defeat your adversary is to recognize Satan has some well-laid plans and deliberate deception that he set before you. He baits us. He sets traps to lure you into a place of imprisonment where he can control your entire thought life and eventually destroy everything that you have that's keeping you alive. Your very existence. The devil's a liar, and Jesus calls him the father of lies. He says, and all of his false, and all that is false, because John the eight forty four, John eight chapter, verse forty four, Jesus called him the father of lies. He said he lies to you and me, and he tells us things about ourselves and about other people and about circumstances that are not true. He does not, however, tell us the entire lie all at one time. 
He begins by bombarding our minds with a cleverly devised pattern of little nagging thoughts, suspicions, fears, doubts, wondering, reasonings, and theories. He moves slowly and cautiously after a, after all, a well-laid plan takes time. So the enemy, if you recognize that the enemy, he's not going to bombard you at one time with anything that's going to be visible. It's going to really stand out to capture your attention. But he's going to come in subtle ways with little bitty things that's going to cause you to get tricked up and fall off course. Remember, Satan has well laid plans and he comes in a subtle way to gravitate your thought life to follow after his devices. Not only that, he knows what we like and what we don't like. He knows our insecurities. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our fears. He knows what bothers us the most. He is willing to invest any amount of time it takes to defeat us. One of the devils, this is what I found very fascinating in this book. One of the devil's strongest points is patience. How many of us have patience? We pray for patience. When things are going on in our life that's out of control, we pray for tolerance, pray that God give us the strength to overcome. But do we really rely on God's patience? Because the Bible tells us that tribulation, troubles, trials, tests are things that produces patience in you. So it's up to you to recognize that you got to give into the spirit of God and allow the word of God to have dominion and authority of your thought life. And when God's word permeates your thought life, it takes control of your thought life, it, it penetrates the dark, darkened crevices of your mind, then God reveals himself to you in your thought life to bring a change in your entire life. Tearing down strongholds. Tearing down strongholds. Hallelujah. For the weapons of warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they're mighty through before God to overthrow and the destruction of strongholds. So what it says here, God's word is our weapon. And you got to know how to use God's word as a weapon, because when you get into the place where you study, you meditate, you devour, you speak the word of God, the word penetrates your heart. And when the word gets into your heart, the word begins to manifest your strength and your weaknesses and show you how much your dependency needs to be not on yourself or any other, other person or any other place or thing, but in God. Because the weapons of warfare, they're not flesh and blood, but they're mighty through what? For through God to pulling down the destruction, the annihilation of strongholds in your mind. Through careful strategy and cunning deceit, Satan attempts to set up strongholds in our mind. A stronghold is in an area in which we are held in bondage, in prison due to certain ways of thinking. In this passage, the Apostle Paul tells us that we have the weapons we need to overcome Satan's stronghold. We, we will learn more about this weapon later, but right now, notice, once again, we see that we are engaged in warfare, in spiritual warfare. Verse 5 shows us clearly the location of the battlefield in which this warfare is waged. The Amplified Version says that we are to take these weapons and refute Fight against, stand against arguments. The devil argues with us. He offers us theories and reasonings. Let's deal with the natural mindset, the man, the, the, the humanism, the fleshly mindset. All of this activity goes on in our mind. The mind is the battlefield. Summary. If you got the book, I'm on per, page eight in, in the battle for the mind. We're going to go through the book uh, page by page, chapter by chapter, until we um, get to the end of the book, unless God leads me in another direction. But it said, thus so far, we are engaged in a war, number one, 
we are engaged in a war. Number two, the enemy is Satan. Number three, the mind is the battlefield. Number four, the devil works diligently to set up strongholds in our minds. Number five, he does it through strategy and deceit, through well-laid plans and deliberate deception. Number six, he is in no hurry. He takes his time to work out his plan. So I'm going to read it again. These, these six points, the summary of situations, the summary of situations. We are engaged in a war. Number one. Number two, our enemy is Satan. Number three, the battlefield, the mind is the battlefield. Number four, the devil works diligently to set up strongholds in our mind. Number five, he does it through strategy and deceit, well laid plans and deliberate deceptions. Number six, he is in no hurry. He takes his time to work out his plan. So let's examine his plan more clearly through a parable. Here's a, a scenario. It says, Mary and her husband, John, are not enjoying a happy marriage. There's strife between them all the time. They are both angry, bitter, and resentful. They have two children who are being affected by the problem in the home. The strife is showing up in the schoolwork and the behavior. One of the children is having stomach problems caused by nerves. Isn't that something? How problems can create illnesses in our bodies? It can cause you to have ulcers. It can cause you to have nervousness in your stomach with your stomach always upset, never settled. It can cause resentment, bitterness, angry. Cause you just get out of character because you're just not happy with what's going on in your life. Mary's problem is that she doesn't know how to let John be the head of their home. She is bossy. She wants to make all the decisions. She handled the finances and disciplined the children. She wants to work so she would have her own money. She is independent, loud, and demanding, and a nag. I don't know about you, but I couldn't stand being in a house like that. If I had someone in my life that's always nagging, that's always uh, trying to be in charge, a wife that's always trying to root, run everything in the house, don't want to listen, don't let, let you be the head of the house because she feels like she's the boss in the house, that, that's a terrible position to be in. And the way God designed marriage, that's a whole other subject, but I'm going to give you this one little nugget. The way God designed marriages to be in today's society is the man supposed to be the head of, of, the, of the household, the head of the wife is Christ, the head of the church. And he's supposed to govern his family based on the leadership of the Holy Spirit that governs his life through prayer and consecration. Then it goes on. It's about now, you may think, I've got her answer. She needs to know Jesus. She does know him. Mary received Jesus as her savior five years ago, three years after she and John were married. Do you mean there hasn't been a change in Mary since receiving Jesus as savior? Yes, there has been a change. She believes she is going to heaven, even though her bad behavior caused her to feel constant condemnation. She has no hope now. Before she met Jesus, she was miserable and hopeless now she's just miserable. They don't have no hope. It says she has hope now, but she's just miserable. Then it goes on and says, Mary knows that her attitude is wrong. She, she wants to change. She has received counseling from two people. She takes every opportunity to, to be prayed for and asks for victory over anger, rebellion, unforgiveness, resentment, and bitterness. Why hasn't she, uh, why hasn't she uh, improved any, seen any improvement? Why hasn't she seen any improvement? The answer is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after or adapted to its eternal, superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind 
by his new ideas and his new attitude so that you may prove for yourself what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the things which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So the key to changing this type of behavior, this is a, a, a rebellious behavior, is to get in the word of God, to allow the word of God, as I said earlier, to change your thinking. Mary has a stronghold in her mind. They have been there for years. She doesn't even understand how they got there. She knows she shouldn't be rebellious, bossy, nagging, etc. But she doesn't know what to do to change her nature. Many people, this is a great point here, a very great point. Mary has a stronghold in her mind. A lot of God's people today in the body of Christ have strongholds in their minds. And those strongholds have been there because of something that you allow, when I said earlier, to open up a breach in your heart where the enemy came in and has access into your mindset, into your life. So he afflicts you. He afflicts you with a stronghold or something that controls your attitude, that controls your nature, controls your character, and it causes you to be defeated in your mind. And it says she doesn't understand how they got there. And sometimes we don't even know what we did to open up that breach. But the thing about God, he says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. He knows us very well. He knows the ends and the outs of us. He knows the beginning and the end of our life. He knows what buttons to push. He knows what, what came into our life, the cause of the fall. And, he's, and so the thing about this scenario here, Mary doesn't understand how he even got there. So we all can say the same thing at one point or another in our lives. We don't know how I became rebellious. I don't know how I became bossy. I don't know how I became nagging. I don't know how I became resentful. I don't know how I became miserable. I don't know how I allowed the enemy to come into my life in such a degree to where he just, just destroyed my entire mindset. I'm so confused in my mind. My mind is mentally torment. I'm, I, I'm going through so much stuff in my mind to now I'm starting to act it out through my behavior. Isn't that something? Your mind controls your behavior. And it's up to you to recognize that this is the avenue the enemy wants to be in your life to guide you down a pathway of destruction. But you got to let the Spirit of God come into your mindset to change you. Then it says, it seems that she simply reacts to certain situations in an unseemly way because she can't control her actions. That's something. She simply reacts in certain situations. Whatever it is, that thing that irritates you the most. It can be another person that just irritates you. Every time they speak something to you, it just irritates you. Every time they do a certain thing, it just irritates you. So you get upset, you get uptight, and all of a sudden you start lashing out in your behavior, out of just blurring out uh, um, stuff that you shouldn't be saying to hurt somebody else's feelings. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Mary can't control her actions because she doesn't control her thoughts. Key point. Take note of this. You cannot control your actions if you don't know how to learn to control your thoughts. You cannot control your mouth. The things that you blurt out, ver vulgar and, and just, just stuff that's just nasty and just, just tacky folk. You cannot control that if you don't learn how to control your thought line. So she doesn't control her thoughts because she doesn't even know that, that doing, doing so is an option for her. There are strongholds in her mind that the devil set up early in her life. The enemy is so cunning and manipulative. He set up strongholds even as a child would become of the age of understanding. He had caused the child to become a liar. Every child that's born in this world becomes a liar at one point or another in their life because the stronghold has been planted from a behavior of watching their parents and how they live their life before them. That's just a key point right there. How are you living your life before your children? What are you doing to guide your children? What behavior are you manifesting before your children? Because your children is a mirror image of who you are. 
And if you are a liar, a deceiver, a manipulator, you're a hater, you're, you're hateful, you're prejudiced, you're miserable, everything that you do reflects your children until God gets a hold of their mind. Satan begins to initiate his well-laid plans and so his deliberate deception at a very young age. In Mary's case, her problem started long ago in childhood. I'm on page nine in the book. As a child, Mary had an extremely domineering father who often spanked her just because he was in a bad mood. Abuse. That's abuse. You spank your child because you mad at the father or the mother or the mother mad at the father the fa mad at the father or the father mad at his wife or mad, mad at his mother all this different stuff so you take it out on your children you know what I'm talking about y'all know what I mean you trying to take out your anger on your children because you mad at somebody else might be mad at your boss on your job you might have had a, had a bad incident when you went into a store with, with, the, with the clerk there. Doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you allow to dominate your thought life, if you don't master that thing at that moment, it's going to control your attitude. And your attitude is going to affect everyone connected to you like a domino effect. I'm mad, so I'm going to go home, cause my significant other to be mad. I'm going to cause the children to be mad. I'm going to cause when they friends come, I'm going to cause them to be mad because everything I do Reflects everybody else. Why? Because we're in a relationship. We're connected. That's the same way it is with God. God's relationship in your life, when you walk by faith and not by sight, by surrendering yourself to his lordship and his authority, everything you do reflects everyone connected to you. So you can bring be the key point piece in your house to change everybody's life. But if you don't know how, to walk in your authority as a woman or a man of God, everything you do is going to reflect everyone connected to you. It says for years, it says, matter of fact, we go up a little further. It says, if she made one wrong move, he would he would vent his anger on her. For years she suffered helplessly as her father mistreated her and her mother. He was disrespectful in all his ways towards his wife and daughter. Mary's brother, however, could do no wrong. It seems that if his, he was favored just because he was a boy. That's a shame. So you make this respect the person, difference between your children, become a respect of persons, and you treat one child different than the other child. And this is the key point in this, this passage of the, of the, of the chapter is you got to be able to extend the same love equally towards every family member in your house. You can't treat one person different than you treat the other because God is going to hold you accountable for how you reflect your behavior towards your family or the people you're connected with. By the time she was 16, Mary had been brainwashed for years by Satan who told her lies that went something like this. Men really think they are something. They are all alike. You can't trust them. They will hurt you and take advantage of you. If you're a man and you got it uh, made in life, you can do nothing, do anything you want. You can order people around, be the boss, and treat people any way you please. And nobody, especially, and, and no, and a nobody, especially not wives and daughters, can do anything about it. So nobody could do anything about the way your your attitude is reflected towards somebody else as a man. Because it, what she's saying here, that men, this one was brainwashed to think that men, all men are the same. Men don't know how to love their spouses. Men don't know how to treat their families. Men don't know how to do anything uh, but love themselves and they don't have to love nobody else. And, and she's saying here that no one could do anything, anything about that, which is a lie from the pit of hell. Because God has a way you can't go over. 
He got a way you can't go under. He got a way you can't go around it. You must come in the door. You must come before God for yourself and present yourself as a living sacrifice. Then God has the power to change your thought life. He can change the things that have been planted even as a child in your life from Satan that, just, that pretty much destroyed your life until you came to Christ. God knows how to purge your mind from those things that held you once in captivity. Then it goes on and says, as a result, Mary's mind was resolved. When I got away from here, nobody is ever going to push me around again. So she made her mind up because she thought all men were the same way. So she put up this defense mechanism that, you know what? Nobody is going to ever treat me like this again in my life. I'm not going to be pushed around. I'm not going to be a pushover. But I'm going to take authority over whoever coming to my life. And that's how she treated her husband. Satan was already waging a war on the battlefield of her mind. Play those, he played those thoughts over and over in your head a hundred thousand times or more over a period of 10 years. And if you see you're already to get, if you see you're ready to get married and become so sweet, submissive, adoring wife, even by the time some miracle you want to be, you, it won't even happen. Pretty much what it's saying. It's not going to happen because you, you're not going to be submissive because you already got your mind made up. A man not gonna, not gonna rule me. He not gonna control me. He don't, he's not gonna take charge of me. I'm gonna be in charge of my whole life. Even if I'm married, I'm still gonna be in charge. Cause I've been abused. I've been mistreated. I've been manipulated. I've been hurt. I've been cast down. So my mind, I got my defense up that nobody gonna ever treat me like this again. So, so we gotta recognize the tactics the enemy uses against us to hurt us. It so even if by some miracle you should want to be, you won't want know how. This is the kind of mess in which Mary finds herself today. What can she do? What can any of us do in such a situation? The weapons of the word. The weapons of the word. If you abide in my word, hold fast to my teachings and live according with them, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. St. John chapter 8 verse 31 and 32. St. John chapter 8 verse 31 and 32. Here Jesus tells us how we win the victory over the lies of Satan. We must get the knowledge of God's truth in us, renew our minds with his word, and then use the weapons of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 to tear down the strongholds and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. These weapons are the word received through preaching, teaching, books, CDs, DVDs, conferences, and private Bible studies. So there's a lot of materials that are in place in our time today. Well, we can even put it up on YouTube. We can, we can uh, put it up on the internet. We have so many different media streaming sources where we can find the word of God so we have no excuse for not getting the word of God in our spirits. It's up to you to make up your mind that I'm going to allow the word of God to penetrate the hidden crevices of my heart where those strongholds have been set in place through generation, through years to where he can strip them of their power and break them off your mind. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So, but we must by continue in the word until it becomes revelation given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Continually is very important. Don't quit midstream. Don't quit. Keep pursuing God's word. Keep studying God's word. Keep meditating on God's word. Keep speaking God's word. Keep living by the word because it's the word that's going to change your mindset. It's the word that's going to govern the outcome of your life. And it's up to you to put the word inside of you. No matter which way it comes, the radio, the television, YouTube, internet, other people, churches, whatever, whichever source God uses 
to put the word in you, you got to gravitate to the word of God and allow that word to be rooted and grounded in your heart. And the word will begin to cause you to think about your behavior and your actions. Am I pleasing God? Am I being a hypocrite? Am I being deceptive? Am I lying to myself, thinking I'm doing good when I'm really doing bad? Because the word will show you as a mirror who you really are and what's going on in your life. It's so important. Continue is important. In Mark chapter 4, verse 24, St. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus says, the measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear would be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. I repeat, we must continue using the weapons of the word. We must continue to use the weapons of the word because the word that's going to defeat your adversary in your life is the word that's going to give you the strength to overcome. It's the word that's going to defeat the, the, the lofty thoughts and the thing that tries to set itself up against the knowledge of God. It's the word that's going to tear down those hidden crevices in your heart of things that have been buried in the treasure chest of your heart that nobody knows about. That's where God begins to pluck it up, uproot it, and burn it in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Two other spiritual weapons available to us are praise and prayer. Praise defeats the devil quicker than any other battle plan, but it must be genuine heart of praise, not just lip service. Praise and, or a method let me continue what I said. I just lost myself. Okay, give me a second. Okay, so then it goes on and says, but it must be genuine heart of praise, not just lip service or a method of, of being tried to see if it works. Also, praise and prayer both involve the word. We must praise God's word according to his word and his goodness. So it's very important to develop in your life a good habit, a routine, of giving God praise and prayer, seeking God's face, because prayer is a relationship with the God here. Prayer is a relationship that communes with God between you and God, mano a mano, with God speaks to you, you speak to God, and God begins to give you revelation, understanding from his word, what you need to apply to your heart to help bring changes to your life, to live a fruitful and abundant life in the kingdom of God. Prayer is coming and asking God for help or talking to God about something that bothers us. It is fellowship, friendship, and an opportunity to express gratitude for all that God is and God does. Prayer is an outward confession that comes from our audible voice, but it's from the heart. It's not just going through routine because somebody else does it. It's not just putting on a show to sound good before people that I can pray. I know how to talk to God. No, it's a genuine act of the heart that communicates with God to tell God how much I appreciate the life changes you brought into me when I accept you in my life through your son, Jesus, and how you change my mind and my attitude. And every day I try to live a fruitful, abundant life to please you. That's our communication with God. If you want to have an effective prayer life, develop a good personal relationship with the Father. Know that he loves you and that his, he is full of mercy and that he will help you. Get to know Jesus. He is your friend. He died for you. Get to know the Holy Spirit. He is with you all the time. As the helper, let him help you. Learn to fill your prayers with the word of God. In other words, pray the word. Find your favorite scripture. Pray that scripture to God. And I guarantee those scriptures will come alive to you because the revelation will begin to unfold from the Spirit of God, from God's heart to you to help change your direction. Well, you might be going in the wrong way at this time, but the Word of God will restruct your direction. It'll give you a new plan. It'll give you the, the purpose. It'll give you the mission that God has for your life that you can walk by faith and not by sight. 
Psalms chapter 9, verse 10. Book 9. Psalms book 9, verse 10. It says that we seek God on his authority of his word and the right of our necessities need. So seeking God's word, the authority of his word will begin to meet your need. That's how God operates. Amen. So our weapons are the word used in various ways. We can pray the word. We can speak the word. We can sing the word. We can study the word. As Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, our weapons are not carnal, fleshly weapons, but they are spiritual weapons. We need spiritual weapons because we are fighting master spirits, the devil himself. Even Jesus used the word as a weapon in the wilderness to defeat the devil. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 13. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 13. Each time the devil lied to him, Jesus responded with the word. It is written. And he quoted him to the word. Because the word was the word speaking to the enemy. Jesus was that word. The word he quoted in the wilderness was the word himself speaking to the enemy. As Mary learns to use her weapons, she will begin to tear down the strongholds that have been built in her mind. She will know the truth that will set her free. She will see that not all men are like her earthly father. Some are, but many are not. Her husband, John, is not. John loves Mary very much. So next week, we're going to pick up on John's side of the story. So they just gave the scenario of her side of the story, uh, the reason why her behavior and her actions are so negative, and the reason why she acts the way she does is because of a past abuse that's taking place in her life. So next week, we're going to pick up with John's side of the story and talk about John, her husband, who loves her so much and his response to what's going on, the way his wife's behavior is. So I thank everyone for tuning in tonight. This is a very powerful book. I don't know if you have this book in your library yet, but you really need to get this book. This book is going to set you free because there's so much in this book that we can study from, and it will change. It will change your thinking. God wants to change your thinking. He wants you to get to the place where you recognize the importance of having, having the word in your life, and that word will manifest in you to bring a change in your entire life direction of life. Your life is set by the word. It is up to you to recognize that you got to stay in the word of God. Allow the word to get inside of you. And when you do that, that word will begin to manifest in such a way it will empower you and enrich you to change your attitude and your character. So as we do each week, you might be a backslider. You don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, as a sinner. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly and knowingly. And I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Now, thank you, Lord God, for forgiving me. Now, fill with the Holy Spirit and that with the power to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that simple prayer, welcome to the family of God. Not only welcome to the family of God, but those of you who are backsliders pray this prayer, receive the restoration because God just restored you back to right standing with himself through his son, Jesus. And then also, if you desire to sow a seed into this ministry, it's for the materials. It goes right back into the ministry. Every seed that's sown, it doesn't matter the amount of the seed. It's about the heart of how you give the seed. If you're giving a seed with the expectation of God to do something miraculous in your situation, in your life, sow a seed. And I guarantee that seed will touch the heart of God in such a way that by faith, it's going to release the promise in your life that God has for you. And God will meet your every need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I uh, thank you again for tuning in tonight. I, I see everyone that joined in. God bless you. Thank you for your support tonight. Stay encouraged. Stay excited about Jesus. Know that God loves you, and I love you too. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray, oh God, that this word will penetrate the crevices of our heart, 
to help bring a change in our lives, our presence, and our future destiny, oh God. And that you, Father God, will be the source and the finisher of our, of our hearts, oh God, to strengthen us, to empower us, to keep moving forward by faith in your word. And we thank you. And we bind every demonic force, every hindering spirit, every distraction, every lie of the devil spoken to your people, God, right now in Jesus' name. We cast it down back to the pit of hell where it come from. We loose the power of the anointing to destroy every yoke and remove every burden. I speak healing and deliverance in the lives of your people, God, because the word has the power to do just what you purpose to do, God. You said your word that goeth forth from your mouth will not return to you void. But that which you speak, Father God, it will prosper. It will manifest. It will do as you please according to your heart's desire. And we thank you, Lord God, that by faith we receive the word tonight that is spoken about the balance of the mind. Help it to manifest in our lives and keep it in the midst of our hearts, oh God, that we meditate on this word and we keep on speaking this word over ourselves that we are children of the most high God. We're blessed and highly favored. We're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. And Father God, no matter what we do, that God loves us unconditionally. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do anyone have any questions tonight? Anyone have any questions that you'd like to type at this time? Feel free to do so. And I'll try to answer your, your question. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Well, again, thank you again for tuning in, everyone. God bless you, uh, uh, Prophet Elisha. Good to see you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I will put it on YouTube um, after the lesson tonight. I post it on YouTube so those who don't have Facebook will be able to, uh, to uh, go back and listen to the lessons as well. So we'll be on my YouTube channel. And what I'll do, I'll inbox you my YouTube channel. And that way you have the information to share with someone else. They want to uh, go on and see the, the, pre, the pre previous lessons. My tongue can get twisted. Forgive me. But the previous lessons and studies I have done for the last uh, uh, almost a year now, um, they are on Facebook, I mean on YouTube as well. Um, the book, The Battlefield of the Mind, Joyce Myers, The Battlefield of the Mind. Amen. Also, I'm going to um, put it on my page again. I'll be posting it uh, each week on there as well, the YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to follow me and subscribe to my channel, feel free to do so and share it with others. These lessons that we're, we're going through each week, because not, they're not just for you, but they're for other people, saved or unsaved, that might need to hear the message from the Lord about changing the way they think. And you never know how God may convict their hearts to draw them to himself into salvation. So you all stay encouraged and stay excited. Let's see if I have a class that wants to you know. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'll definitely send it to you tonight when, uh, when we're done. God bless you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else got a question before we go? Any other questions? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Matter of fact, I'm going to post it on here. All right, you all have a blessed night until next week. We'll be on again at 6 o'clock on next week. And again, I just love you all and feel your support. For those of you who've been following me for almost a whole year now, it's just been truly a blessing to have you support the ministry 
by your presence. And I, I pray God continue to just bless you and, and meet your every need financially, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, whatever it is you need God to do. I pray the Lord does it. And until next week, shalom.